I want to put in front of you two ideas. And then there's a larger idea about how these two ideas fit together. And I call these ideas, uh, the first one is what I call the tragedy of common sense morality. And the second idea is the idea of the dual process moral brain. One is about two kinds of moral problems, and the other is about two kinds of moral thinking. And what I'm going to talk about is how these two kinds of problems and how these two kinds of thinking best fit together. So I, I assume that a lot of you are familiar with the tragedy of the commons. This goes back to the, to the biologist Garrett Hardin's uh, 1968 paper dramatizing the problem of cooperation. And so in, in Hardin's parable, what we have are a bunch of herders who share a common pasture. And for each of the herders, it makes sense for them to add animals to their herd. As a herder, the more animals you have, the more money you make when you sell your animals at market. But because they graze on a common pasture, each individual is, is advantaged by adding more animals, but the group uh, after a certain point begins to suffer. And if the, uh, if, if the herders do what's individually rational, add more and more animals, <coughs> Eventually, the commons won't be able to sustain any animals, and there will be nothing left. And so this is the tragedy of the commons. And this, is, this parable is really the fundamental, it illustrates the fundamental problem of morality, and really I think the fundamental problem behind all of the larger problems that we're interested in, which is the problem of cooperation, of getting individuals to put their self-interest, individual rationality, uh, aside in favor of what's best for all of us as a whole. This can be in individual relationships or it can be in, 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 in uh, individuals within groups. So it, for short, I call the, this problem me versus us. This is the standard problem of cooperation that we're used to thinking about when we, we think about self-interest versus collective interest. Now, um, so what do you do? Well, we all know the answer. You have, to, you have to get the herders to limit the size of their herds. Well, that sounds reasonable, but there are many different terms on which cooperation can be achieved. So you say, well, how are sheep allotted? Is it that each herder gets the same number of sheep? Does it depend on the size of the herder's family? Do bigger sheep count more than smaller sheep? What happens if you inherit a bunch of sheep from all of your uncles at the same time? Does that mean you don't get to keep your inheritance? There are a lot of different ideas about how to cooperate and a lot of different ideas about fairness. And societies can be structured radically differently depending on their conceptions of fairness, depending on their sense of what we're going to do, how we're going to limit ourselves or not in order to get along. So at one extreme of one dimension, we have these communist or socialist herders over here. So they've dealt with the problem by saying, not only do we have a common pasture, we're going to have a common herd. And that way, there's no problem. We all are, all of our interests are aligned. Of course, uh, communism doesn't always work out so well. It has some advantages and has some disadvantages. But at least, as they like to say, in theory, this is one way that you can solve uh, the tragedy of the commons. Now, going to the other extreme, you may have our, our free market capitalists where they'll say, not only are we not going to have common herds, we're not going to have a common pasture anymore. We're going to divide it up into different plots, and everybody's responsible for their own business. And this has both advantages and disadvantages. And it's not that necessarily one of these is bad or one of these is good, at least a priori. Some may work better than others. But they're both recognizable attempts to achieve cooperation and can work with varying degrees of success. Now, when you have different groups, there are other differences between, besides how collectivist is their approach to solving cooperation problems or how individualist is it. Different groups <coughs> pray to different gods. They have different customs, different ways of life, different attitudes towards things like female herders, for example. Uh, you notice I, didn't, I couldn't find good uh, female herding icons. Uh, but uh, the point is that not only the groups can, can vary on a lot of different dimensions uh, in terms of what their sense of fairness is, how they think a society should be organized, um, and, uh, and, and, and the specific gods that they pray to, the customs that they, they, they live by, etc. So now I want to present to you a sequel to, Har to Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, and this is what I refer to as the Tragedy of Common Sense Morality. So let's imagine that these groups are here, and then the forest that separates them burns down, and now we have this new pasture after the, the ashes are gone and the rains have come. There are these lovely rolling hills in between, and they both want in. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen on the new pasture? Are we going to have a more collectivist kind of society? Are we going to have a more individual society? Which gods are going to be in charge? Which people are going to be in charge? Which customs will prevail? Who has to respect whose, whose customs? How much respect do they have to afford to each other's uh, religion? Are they allowed to make nasty videos about Mohammed and so on and so forth. Um, this essentially is the modern world. Obviously, this doesn't capture all aspects of the modern world. <laughs> but the, 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 the central idea is that this is not just simple me versus us. 
now we have a different kind of us versus them. Instead of it just being about my selfishness versus what's good for other people or good for the group, now we have different groups with different visions of what it means to be a decent and just and fair and appropriate society all converging on the new pastures of the modern world. So I call this problem us versus them. And it can be us versus them in two senses. One is it's our interest versus their interest. We both want the land. In that sense, it's, 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 it's something approaching a zero-sum game. In any case, there are things at stake. And the other could just be our vision of right and wrong versus your vision of right and wrong. Over here, we're happy with gay marriage. Over there, we're not. So it doesn't have to just be uh, self-interest. It can be us versus them in terms of interest or in terms of moral ideals. So that's the first idea. The second idea I'd like to introduce by thinking a bit about photography. So I, I am a very much amateur photographer. This is the camera I got for my birthday many years ago. And it's a good camera for a bumbler like me because it has these little automatic settings. So you see it's got the, the, the landscape mode and the portrait mode. And what's great about this is that for most photographic circumstances, you just point and shoot, you put it in the right mode, and everything works well. Very, very occasionally I get ambitious and I want to do something fancy. I want someone off to the side and out of focus and so on and so forth. And if I'm going to do that, then I have to put the camera in manual mode where I can adjust the f-stop and everything else by hand. So why have a camera with automatic settings and manual mode? Well, what it really does is it allows you to navigate the ubiquitous trade-off between efficiency and flexibility. So the automatic settings, the point and shoot, they're very efficient easy to use, you're not likely to make a mistake, but not very flexible. They're good for what they're good for, and that's about it. Manual mode is maximally flexible. You can do anything with it, but it's not as efficient. It takes time, you have to think, you have to know what you're doing, you're more likely to make a mistake. And this, I think, is, 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 is a fundamental trade-off in any kind of decision system. When you have your, your customer service, do you want to have expensive people who are very flexible or cheap and efficient computers that are efficient but that, that are not very flexible? And this is the theme of Daniel Kahneman's wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow, about decision-making more generally. So. Uh, the human mind has automatic settings in manual mode as well. And essentially, our automatic settings are our gut reactions, which are often emotional, intuitive. We don't necessarily know how they work, but they work pretty well. And then our manual mode is our capacity for deliberate, conscious reflection. So thinking fast versus thinking slow. And since this is right after lunch, I'll give you an example from the non-moral domain. So in this uh, study by, by Shivan Federikin, they presented people with what they thought was just a memory experiment. And on the way to the second half of the experiment, there was a little cart with dessert snacks. And they said, take a snack for yourself. We have fruit salad. We have chocolate cake, take what you want. And then uh, as under the guise of the memory experiment, some people had to memorize a two-digit number and report it in the next room. 40% of those people <coughs> chose cake. Other people had to remember a seven-digit number. And twice as many as those people chose cake. What's going on? You remember large, larger numbers, and now you want cake. The idea is that your manual mode is disrupted. You have this automatic setting that says, cake, yum, yum, yum. And you have a manual mode that says, you know, you're getting kind of fat. Uh, so maybe you should not have so much. Uh, better to have a slimmer waistline later this, uh, later, later this summer. Um, so this illustrates the tension between the automatic response and, 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 and the manual mode. And we actually know a fair amount about how these different uh, processes play out in the brain. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these brain regions in a moment. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which seems to be a kind of relay station for weighing different kinds of uh, decision weights, especially emotional ones. And then the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which to oversimplify things a bit is sort of the center of, of, of manual mode thinking. OK, so how does this apply to morality? To take an example that's a bit unrealistic but very, I think, illuminating nevertheless is our old friend the trolley problem. Maybe old friend to me, maybe not to you. So philosophers have been arguing about these d dilemmas for decades. Here's the first one, which I'll call the switch dilemma. You can hit the switch that will turn the trolley. The trolley is headed towards these five people. They're going to die. But you can save them by hitting a switch that will turn the trolley away from the five and onto the one. Now, so what goes on in your dual process brain? Well. Your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex says five versus one. That sounds like a good deal. Not much of an emotional response. And as a result, most people make what I'll loosely call the utilitarian response. That is to say, better to save more lives, better to produce a, a, a good outcome. In a somewhat different <coughs> case, sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Uh, in this case, this trolley is headed towards these five people. And now the only way to save them is to push this big guy 
off of the footbridge and he will land on the tracks and he will get squashed by the trolley and he will die, but the five people will be saved. Now I know what you're thinking, why can't you jump yourself? Is this actually going to work? You're very smart people, you can work your way around outside of the problem. Trust me, even when you accept all of these assumptions, you're going to get the psychology that I described. Now this part you won't disagree with. Five lives for one, that makes sense to at least part of your brain. But here, you have an emotional response that makes you say, gosh, but pushing that guy off the footbridge, using him as a trolley stopper, that just seems wrong. And as a result, most people give it a response that's consistent with something Immanuel Kant might say, that you just cannot use this guy as a means to even that good end. Um, now, how do we know this? Well, there's been a lot of research by myself and other people getting at this. I'll just tell you about one kind of experiment, uh, leveraging the, the idea. So there are patients like the famous Phineas Gage, who have damage to what I mentioned before, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is a kind of center for weighing, put, having emotional weights bear on decisions. And so if you take this dual process psychology and then you knock out the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that is you look at modern day patients who have brain lesions in this emotional center, what you get is more people giving the utilitarian response. In this case, about twice as many, on average for cases like this, five times as many responses <coughs> saying better to, to, to harm this one person in order to, to achieve this greater good. So this is really, in a sense, background, this idea of emotions telling us one thing and controlled cognition telling us something else. Um, oh, and, and when you look at people's brains when they're making these kinds of decisions, you see increased activity in what I mentioned before, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, manual mode, when people make the utilitarian judgments. Same part of the brain, roughly, that shows increased activity when people resist the temptation of the immediate reward, when they say no to chocolate cake. So, two kinds of moral problems, two kinds of moral thinking. How do they fit together? So this is about the tragedy of the commons, and this is work done with David Rand and Martin Novak using what's called the public goods game, which is an almost perfect analog of the tragedy of the commons for a laboratory situation. So the basic setup is you have four people, each of them gets a sum of money. They can all do what they want with their money. They can keep the money or they can put it into a common pool. Whatever goes into the common pool gets doubled by the experimenter and distributed evenly to everybody. So if you're selfish, what do you do? You keep the money. Why? Well, you get your money and you get your share of whatever anyone else puts into the pool. Free riding, okay? Or you can, uh, the, the, the nice thing to do, the us-ish thing to do is to put as much, uh, put all of your money or at least some of your money in. So now the dual process question is, what makes us cooperative and what makes us uncooperative? So the first thing we did is we had people play these public goods games, just one shot, uh, <coughs> and we looked at their speed. And if you look at the people who decide quickly versus the people who decide slowly, the faster deciders are contributing more. And if you look at this in a more continuous way, you see a quite clear pattern. We've seen this now in lots of different experiments. The quicker you decide, on average, the more likely you are to do the cooperative thing. When we force people to go faster, they're contributions increase. When we force them to stop and think about it, their, 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 their contributions go down. Now you might say, aha, you've discovered that people are innately good. That's actually not I think, what we discovered at all. If anything, our further experiments show that it's really highly dependent on experience. If people are, uh, have a lot of lab experience with these games in which it pays to be selfish, or if they say they don't trust the people they interact with in their daily life, you don't get this effect. So it really depends on one's experience, the institutions in which one's embedded, and I think this is something that Steve uh, may talk about in his talk. So what I want to tentatively suggest is that at least sometimes when it's me versus us, tragedy of the commons, our automatic settings are good. Now I'm not saying that we don't also have worse devils, that we don't also have selfish inclinations, but at least it's possible in situations like this, and there's this evidence and other evidence that in a me versus us context, we actually have gut reactions that can push us towards the cooperative solution. So what about us versus them? Well, in a sense, we already know the answer. When I mean, you look at, uh, at the problems of, of, of these new pastures, war, intergroup conflict, how do we s s deal with global warming, what do we think about uh, bioethical issues like abortion or having an opt-in versus opt-out organ donation program and so on down the line, people, I mean, I know you'll believe me when I say people have different gut reactions about these things. And if that's right, every, everybody's gut reactions can't be correct. So in some sense, we can't rely too much on our gut reactions. Maybe some people's are right, but it can't be the general case that our intuitions about these controversial issues are correct because people have different intuitions. So now I want to illustrate that point with an example uh, coming from a philosophical dilemma that was originally posed by Peter Singer back in the early 70s. This is an experiment done with a wonderful undergraduate named Jay Musen 
so the situation is like this. Uh, you're, you're vacationing in some uh, poor, lovely country. You have your little cottage in the hills overlooking the sea. There's a terrible disaster, um, devastation below. You, you're safe in your little cottage overlooking the sea, but you can help by making a donation. And we ask people, how much of a moral obligation do you have to make a donation? And for this set of questions, 68% of people said yes. Different version. Everything's the same, except it's not you who's over there. It's your friend who's over there. And your friend has a smartphone and is showing you everything that's going on. You see everything that your friend sees. You know everything that your friend knows. And you can donate just as well uh, over the internet, just as you do it here. How many people, a separate group of people, of course, ask this, do you have an obligation to donate? About half as many people say that. You know, I don't know if this is a perfect experiment, but it's pretty good. Almost everything's the same, and yet half as many people, just because it's farther away, right? This tells us something that our heartstrings are tuggable, but not necessarily from long distances. And this may be a problem with dealing with life on the new pastures. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but if you want to ask me about utilitarian thinking and moral dilemmas and doctors and people in public health, uh, the short answer is that people in public health think differently about these problems from doctors and, uh, and, and, and ordinary folks. And if you're like me, you think that's probably a good thing. So us versus them. Um, some evidence that we can't rely too much on our intuitions, that they seem to be fickle. They seem to be sensitive to things like literally how many miles away are these people, which is not something that upon reflection we think of as in and of itself an important moral <coughs> condition. Now you might ask, OK, well, if we don't rely on our intuitions, what can we do? Is it all just intuition? Some people suggest that it is. I actually think that's not the case. I think that there is a distinctive kind of philosophy of manual mode. And I'm not going to give you evidence for this because this is a short talk. Um, but I think that John Stuart Mill had the right idea. Thinking in terms of global consequences and trying to structure your own thoughts and your own feelings and institutions within society so as to produce the best kind of consequences in the long run. Now, there are a lot of, I think, sort of cheap shots you can take at utilitarian thinking. And I'm happy to to defend against. I think it's mostly a caricature in people's mind is what they have in mind. Like, just go ahead and push people off the footbridge whenever you want. Um, but what, what this suggests is that, at the very least, we shouldn't be trusting our intuition so much. And maybe there's a better way. Um, so the general idea, when we're dealing with the tragedy of the commons, when it's me versus us, at least sometimes think fast. Trust your intuitions. When it's selfishness versus the good of others, the good of the group, that's, I think, when you're most likely to have moral instincts that are going to do well, that are going to do battle with those selfish instincts. When you're dealing with the tragedy of common sense morality, life on these new pastures, where it's us versus them, our interests versus their interests, our uh, moral ideals versus their ideals, this is where we need to slow down and not give quite as much credit to our intuitive thinking, because our intuitions vary, and they can't all be right, and they can't all be leading to the best outcomes. Um, so you can't see it down there, but I just wanted to say thank you to the National Science Foundation and the John Templeton Foundation for supporting some of the work that I described. And that's it. Thanks.